Please welcome Peter Dannenberg from Google, who will enlighten us on prompt engineering with BARD, further exploring the innovative horizons of AI technology. So Bart appeared to me a couple weeks ago as a chess playing demon. And he said, Peter, by the way, when you give this Dev Fest talk, there's a non-zero probability that you're hallucinating. <laughs> um, I'm Peter Dannenberg, by the way. And so I want to teach you today how to make Bard your ally. And it turns out that the way to Bard's heart is through prompt engineering, where prompt engineering is something like the art of of coaxing Bard into doing what you want it to do. And just to let you know, I've made all the slide, all the codes for this talk available at bard.dog. And you know, actually, I had no idea dog was a TLD. Uh, but if you want to stop by, everything's there. Uh, the plan is I want to talk for maybe 18-ish, 20-ish minutes if I can. And then if we have some time, I'd love to take some questions. Um, so first things first, what is Bard? And I have a conversation that goes something like this probably at least a couple times a week. Somebody will come up to me and say, hey, Peter, what do you do at Google? And I'll mention, well, I work on BARD. And the next question is usually, what is BARD? And the only thing I can say that hits the spot is usually BARD is Google's chat GPT. I, I had to use that on my mom. It's, you know, <laughs> it's the only thing that works. So in some sense, my, my life's work right now is to get the word out about BARD. And so I'm doing that by giving this talk. But I also created a little meetup. So we have this uh, bardmeetup.ai. We get together every couple of weeks at Google, and uh, we just talk about all things BART for a couple hours. I think we even have a little one tomorrow. Uh, Justin's giving a little talk. And anyway, we'd love to have you come by. So what can BART do for you? Um, one of the things I notice when I'm running this workshop is we get problems in that tend to fall into one of three buckets. In particular, sometimes we have these creativity problems. And if you can imagine, somebody wants to, they want to write an email, they want to write um, a newsletter, they want to write a talk, and they want BARD to bootstrap the creativity process. One of the techniques I'd like to teach you uh, to influence the style and the content of BARD is this thing called persona, where you can assign a persona to BARD. And next is we get these uh, sort of problems I, I call factuality problems. And these are problems involving the world somehow. So somebody wants, uh, they're interested in shopping or trivia, the stock market, that sort of thing. And I'm going to teach you a technique called grounding, which shows you how to make the utterances from Bard, how to make them true and timely. And lastly, we have this thing called reasoning. Um, there's a funny thing where Bard speaks code better than it speaks English, right? So if you have a problem that you can't solve uh, in English, try code. Um, and you know, so before we even begin, how do you, how do you even use Bard? And if you're, just, if you're just kind of a casual user coming in from the public, you just go to bard.google.com. It's the front end. It's polished. It's beautiful. Uh, but because we're developers here, I'm going to focus on the, the Palm API. And the reason why I want to do that is I want to, I want to peel away these successive layers of magic that make the front end more factual, more creative, more, more reasonable. I want to give you an intuition for what's happening at the model level and, right, and, and give you an intuition for how you'd build your own front end if you wanted to. Um, and so this first class of, of problems, these so-called creativity problems, so somebody came into the workshop a couple weeks ago, and they wanted to write a play. And in particular, they wanted to write a play called Dogecoin in Athens. So this was supposed to be somebody comes and drops cryptocurrency into ancient Greece, and what happens? right? What, what shenanigans ensue? And if you ask Bard about this play, Dogecoin in Athens, it gives you this nice uh, kind of cliff note summary. But what happens if we want to ask about the economic ramifications? So you notice that Bard goes into a little more detail. But Bard drops this little hint, which is that the play was written by Aristophanes. And we can actually use that to influence the way Bard presents his play. So right now, we have this kind of cliff note version. But this friend of mine, he really wanted Bard to start writing a play. And how do you do that? One way is you say, Bard, you are Aristophanes. Please write this play. And so you can see we have a title. There's an author. And then boom, in the year 4, 415 BCE, and so on and so forth, 
So this friend of mine now has, um, now has a, a play that he can use to kind of bootstrap his creative process. But uh, this brings up something kind of funny, right? So uh, when it comes to LLMs, one of the things people talk about a lot is this notion of hallucination, right? And uh, is hallucination, is it a bug or is it a feature? <laughs> for these creativity kind of tasks, it's sort of a feature, right? So Bart and I, we can riff about this play, Dogecoin in Athens, that doesn't exist. We can go into all these strange counterfactuals about like cryptocurrency in ancient Greece. Like there's a lot we can do here. But uh, if you ask Bard, Bard, did you hallucinate this thing, Judge Quinn and Athens? Bard tells you confidently, no, like I didn't. Um, and what happens when Bard elaborates a little bit? So Bard said, listen, it's not a hallucination. It's just a joke. Please relax. We're, we're doing some fiction. But what's kind of funny is Bard, I think Bard's actually making a good point. There's a difference between fiction and hallucination. In this fiction case, Bart and I are co-authors, and we're, we're authoring this play that doesn't yet exist, right? And this is almost, I think this is hallucination as a feature, right? We can riff about this thing, we can go into details, but there's an entire class of problems where factuality is, sorry, where, where hallucination is probably more bug uh, than feature, if not bug, at least kind of undesirable behavior, and that's this whole realm of factuality. And uh, somebody who was sitting in the audience actually, uh, so he came to our workshop a couple weeks ago and he said, Peter, I want to shop for monitors. Shopping for monitors for me, it's a little bit stressful. I read and reread these reviews. Can you have Bard just present a nice summary table of you know, some of these monitors on Amazon? And if you ask Bard, Bard complies and you get this beautiful table. Uh, what happens when you click on these links though? <laughs> it's, it's somehow all roads lead to 404, right? So how does this sort of thing happen? It, if you go back to the table, you know, when I look at these URLs, to me, they're indistinguishable from Amazon URLs, right? Maybe it's a little bit sketched that I think the first and the third, they have the same suffix, but they're indistinguishable to me. But it turns out what's happening is Bart is, is convincingly hallucinating these Amazon URLs that it extrapolated probably from its training data, right? How would you, how would you go about fixing something like this? So just to take a step back, um, let's see what happens when we ask Bard the date today. So if you ask Bard what the date is today, today is March 8th. And by the way, it's been March 8th for about eight months, right? And it's, it's, it's convincingly March 8th. When you do this on the front end though, what happens? So if you go to the front end, the front end says, you know what, it's November 16th. Somehow it gets, the, it gets it right. What's actually happening behind the scenes? And it turns out that in the front end, they're doing this thing called grounding which means that you know, basically any time you issue the query, there's this little thing that says, hey, psst, Bart, like, it's November 16th. If anybody asks you about that, like, don't mess it up. <laughs> um, and, and so every time you ask something, behind the scenes, there's this, this grounding is happening, and you're not even necessarily aware of it. Uh, when you use the API, though, you have to be aware of this kind of thing, and um, you have to ground everything. So taking this grounding and going back to shopping, can we ground shopping? And so if you imagine for a moment, imagine we have this function called Search Amazon. Search Amazon takes a little search query and, and gives us a list of URLs. So what we can do is we can, we can inject those URLs into the prompt, we can ground the prompt, and we can say, Bard, please use these URLs. And what happens after we click is all of a sudden we get these beautiful product pages, right? Miraculously. Um, there's something a little bit funny though. So Amazon says this monitor is 109. Right, but if you go back to the table, Bard thinks it's 139, right? So what happened? Anybody? Yeah, that's right. We, we basically, we didn't ground the price. So we granted the URL, we didn't ground the price. And if we go to Bard and we say, Bard, is this monitor really 139 bucks? Bard will say, listen, the day that I was trained, it was 139 bucks. And in fact, on the next day, it was 149. And by the way, I can't even tell you what the price is. Like, so, you know, don't, you know. <laughs> And so what's fascinating about this, though, is that Bard has an intuition for the limits of its knowledge, right? It, Bard is somehow epistemologically sophisticated. And um, what this means is that in theory, everything that comes out of Bard's mouth, you can actually, you can ask it. You can say, hey, listen, are you confident about this or not? And you could potentially use that as a way to filter out sort of, you know, bad facts. For, for our case, however, I think the general principle is uh, if, it's an, if it's important, grounded, otherwise you suppress it. Um, and so, so we have this fantastic example uh, working for monitors, but what happens if we want to generalize for any kind of shopping thing? 
And um, in order to solve that problem, we have to solve a little sub-problem, which is if somebody comes in with this crazy verbose utterance, if somebody comes in and says something like, hey, Bard, I'm, I'm really interested in monitors today. Can you help me out? And blah, blah, blah. You have to take a long utterance like that, and you have to distill it into um, essentially a, a search term that you can use in Amazon. The beautiful thing is uh, Bard is great at these kind of summary tasks. So let's say we have this little uh, subquery here, which is just Bard given some long, uh, given some long utterance, distill this into like a couple search terms on Amazon. And so what we can do is, is we, can use that, uh, we can use that to create this general um, shopping query, which, so I'd like to introduce you, it's this technique called chaining, where basically we're using uh, multiple calls of the LLM to answer some question. And in, in this particular prompt, so we're calling Bard, we're saying, Bard, given this long query, what do we need to search for on Amazon? Uh, we search on Amazon, we take the URLs, we put them in the query, and then we say, Bard, use it for the final output. And the beautiful thing is this generalizes to, we can do Legos, this is terrific. Um, we, can do, um, we can do board games, this is great. But what you notice is that Bard helpfully includes things like player age year, right? And the problem with that is that we haven't grounded it. So uh, non-zero probability of hallucination, if it's important, ground it, otherwise maybe, you know, if, if somebody's life depends on Sagrada being players one through four, maybe, maybe suppress it. Um, great, and so this last, this last kind of problem, which I call reasoning problems, are, these are problems which are algorithmic in nature. So you can imagine, uh, let's say these are computer, these are programming problems, these are math problems. Um, and just to illustrate this, we played this little game with Bard a couple weeks ago, which was Bard reverse the word. And in this particular case, we said, Bard, can you reverse the word craniotomy? I don't know how we came up with craniotomy. Anyway, Bard gives it a shot, right? This is like, it's not bad. It's, you can tell it's trying, and it's kind of, it's sort of halfway there. There's a little technique called, um, called chain of thought, which is where uh, you ask Bard to describe what it's doing. And you can say, hey, Bard, tell me how to reverse a word, and then reverse the word craniotomy. And you can see, to its credit, like Bard successfully reverses, uh, reverses his cat as tack, like fantastic. But when it tries craniotomy, it's still, Ugh, it's close, but it's not quite. I think it's a little bit closer than the last one. The question is, how can we, how can we solve these sorts of problems generally and deterministically? Does anybody have, um, anybody have an idea? Yeah. Actually, that's not a bad idea. So sort of recursive chain of thought. That's not a bad idea. Um, but it turns out one, one more straightforward way to do this is just say, hey, P hey Bard, write Python to do the same thing. But that's a, that's a great idea. Um, if you say, Bard, write Python to do this, you get this, pr this thing back, which is prima facie, this looks like good code to me. It's taking the word. It's, it's iterating in reverse. It has a little test case for craniotomy. Like, this is sort of beautiful. Um, what happens when we execute? Boom, this is craniotomy. So somehow Bard, in this case, it's speaking code better than it's speaking English. It's, um, it's a little bit paradoxical to me. So Bard can write code, but it, does, it, does it understand how it works? If you say, Bard, explain this code to me. What's interesting is Bard gives you the algorithm, and it gives you the code, and, and we can try it again. So it's kind of incredible to me that Bard can write good code, and not only that, it understands the code. And uh, any time I've done like interviewing, uh, interview problems or whatever, I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> like somehow Bard is great at this kind of thing. And what happens, by the way, if you just do this in the UI? So if you go to the Bard UI, it turns out this just magically works. And the reason why this works is because it's doing something called uh, implicit code execution which means that this query comes in, um, it classifies a query as something codish. It says, you know what, I can probably do this with code. Let me write the code and run the code in the background, and I'll just give you the answer. And the problem with this is that as a user, that's all invisible to you. Um, and the other, the other difficulty is that you can't deterministically trigger this. So basically, this is you're kind of at the mercy of the classifier. So if you really, really want this code evaluation, you have to essentially use the API. Great. Um, so I just, I just wanted to see if we could kind of tie everything together. And just as an example, I don't know if you heard, but we released this thing a couple weeks ago called the BART extensions. And this is really just the ability of BART to speak APIs. And you know, if I tell it to find some funny emails, 
you know, I get something from Larry from soccer and uh, something from my mom. Uh, but this is Bard speaking in API, right? And I just wanted to see, as a little experiment, whether um, we, could use, we could get Bard to speak the APIs that we wrote in the course of this talk. So let's say we have the, our creativity API, we have our factuality API, our reasonable API. In the scope of one prompt, um, can you tell Bard that these APIs exist, and can you instruct Bard to use them? And there's kind of a lot going on here, but let's see what's happening. So in the first part of this prompt, I'm telling Bard, you have these, you have these things at your disposal. Um, you have a creativity API, you have a factuality API, you have a reason API. When a query comes in, um, figure out if it's creativity, factuality, reasoning, write the code to call the API, and we'll execute it. So essentially, there's, there's a lot happening here. I think, roughly, this is maybe the equivalent of, I don't know, tens of thousands of lines of code, if I had to guess. I somehow, we're doing a lot in like 25 lines of prompt, right? Uh, and let's just see if it works. So first of all, let's try shopping for the best shoes. This is great. So Bard says, you know what? This is a, this is a factuality query. I'm going to do your Amazon thing. You have these clickable URLs. This is fantastic. Um, what about code? Let's do this Fibonacci thing. Bard says, this is great. Uh, I'll, generate this, I'll generate code to do the Fibonacci thing. We'll run it perfect. And just to make sure we didn't break creativity, uh, let's see if we can write a limerick to close out this conference. Um, let's see how this goes here. There once was a developer named Ben, whose code was so clean it was zen. He spoke at the conference and gave us a glance of the future of Google, my friend. <laughs> Wait a minute, it would have been, but you guys don't off the hook, though. You guys don't off the hook. Let's try it again. <laughs> this time, let's see if can OK, ready? There once was a developer named Ben, whose code was so clean it was zen. He spoke at the conference and gave us a glance of the future of Google, my friend. You know, it's not bad. It's not bad. Actually, can we do it one more time? Maybe get the people from the top. <laughs> 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 All right, let's see. All right, last time. There once was a developer named Ben, whose code was so clean it was zen. He spoke at the conference and gave us a glance of the future of Google, my friend.